This sermon comes from a text in Luke, the Gospel according to Luke, which is under the heading, The Mission of the Seventy. This is Luke 10, the first nine verses. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborers deserve to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Here ends this reading inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Dear Mayflower, this is the Sunday when I normally say goodbye, have a great pulpit series, and head to the mountains. We sing a few patriotic songs for the 4th of July, perhaps blessed be the tie that binds, safe travels, and all that, but this is not a normal year. Maybe you've noticed that this is not a normal year. We will be, in fact, back and forth a few times in July to the cabin, but I plan to be here next Sunday to welcome Kyle Dillingham. His program is called Broken Violins. And don't miss it, because I think we live in the age of broken violins. As the strangest political season of my lifetime moves to Cleveland for the Republican National Convention, I see a system so broken that it might as well be a Stradivarius with one string that nobody wants to play. You have to be careful, you know, what you wish for. Sometimes when you create a monster, it gets up off the table like Frankenstein and lives. It lives. See, decades of teaching people to hate the other worked. Right-wing radio worked. Anti-government hysteria worked. Libertarian think tanks worked. Anti-public school demagoguery worked. A patriarchal backlash against women worked. Homophobia worked. And then there is, of course, racism, the most effective political strategy ever devised. It lives and breathes deep in the heart of this broken violin we call America and the air is full of discordant sounds. We live in a furiously divided nation, and the presidential campaign we're about to live through will be the most divisive in American history. It may also be the most important in American history, and because the arc of civilization may be long and it may bend toward justice, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, it seems like right now it's bending backwards. We hear the footsteps of fascism, history's regular visitor. And each time it visits, people say, we didn't see it coming. They were just certain that extremist candidates would self-destruct and moderation would prevail. But you see, when whole economic systems seem to be failing people and terrorism presents itself as evil incarnate, People do not make rational decisions about the future. They look for shelter. And so while they may say publicly, well, I won't vote for Trump, they may indeed walk into the voting booth and do exactly that. Now, if this sermon's already depressing you, I apologize. For one thing, you don't need a preacher to tell you what you already know, but it might help to have a preacher who's not afraid to tell you what I think we might do about it. I mean, besides just wondering if the world's coming to an end, because we would certainly not be the first people to think that. But in particular, whether the progressive church might have a word to say to the world right now that's different 
than what the world expects to hear from the church, which is very little, of course. No politics from the pulpit, please. Just pray harder and bring a gun to church. No. Come to think of it, the church is a broken violin. The strings have all been snapped by great doctrinal disputes over such weighty matters as whether communion should be served in one cup or many cups. I don't know. Or whether we will recognize Jesus when he comes back or confuse him with a homeless person and who gets left behind. Or whether one kind of Lutheran can really be allowed at the communion table right next to another kind of Lutheran. It's no wonder we don't have any energy left to play the song, the song that says the reign of God has come. I know you don't recognize it, but part of the reason is that we've slammed the door on the neighbor. We eat alone and we watch too much reality TV. First of all, how would you like to be a preacher who follows the lectionary this morning and draw this gospel text on the 4th of July weekend? This, this, this is not easy. The sending out of the 70, two by two, like lambs in the midst of wolves, instructed to carry no bag, no purse, no sandals, to knock doors, invite yourself to dinner, and cure any sick people in the house. I can tell you this, this kind of evangelism will not work today. As one pastor put it, if this story from Luke 10 tells us anything, it tells us that you do not want Jesus organizing volunteers at your church. <laughs> Can you imagine everybody's milling around in the coffee hour after the service, chatting, laughing, getting caught up with each other, and Jesus steps in the middle of the room, clears his throat, holds up a clipboard and says, excuse me, can I have everyone's attention for a minute? I still need 70 volunteers for a service opportunity this week. This is a great chance to go out into strange and dangerous neighborhoods and invite yourself into people's homes. It will be like you are defenseless lambs sent out alone into the midst of ravenous wolves. And oh, please remember not to bring anything that might make it easier or safer or more comfortable for you to do that, okay? So just come on over here, we'll get you all signed up. Thank you. No, when Lori and Colin go out in my neighborhood and knock on doors because they do politics the old-fashioned way, uh, they have some strange and fr frightening experiences uh, that Lori has shared with me. People answer the door in their underwear. Um, they say strange and inappropriate things. Mike knows this too. They're often distrustful and frightened, but one thing is certain, they never invite you in to eat. And Lori and Colin don't announce the reign of God has come, or does anyone in the house need to be healed? I'm, I'm telling you, this kind of evangelism won't work today. And only Luke tells this story, and it's obvious that Jesus expects his disciples to encounter resistance. So although he sends them out with nothing but faith in the hospitality of others, he does send them out in pairs, so that when one is discouraged, the other can offer help and encouragement because that's what we're supposed to do for one another in the beloved community. In our culture, though, it's different. We're expected to be prepared. When you go out, be prepared. What's the Boy Scout motto? Be prepared. We're, we're not supposed to go it alone and without help. We're supposed to be, oh, you know, self-sufficient, rugged individualists. We're taught you only go around once. There's not enough for everyone. You better look out for number one. The one who dies with the most toys wins and all that. But in this story, the disciples depend on one another and on the hospitality of strangers. It almost sounds un-American, and it suggests that we make ourselves vulnerable. Vulnerable, which can also be regarded as foolish instead of making ourselves strong, self-sufficient, and independent. I say this on the weekend of the 4th of July because we are celebrating the spirit of American individualism, but it is a myth to think that we can go it alone. This is why the earliest settlers of this land called their social experiment a commonwealth, a commonwealth. These were places where the good of any individual was inextricably linked to the good of the whole. It was Ben Franklin who said, at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. We must hang together 
or assuredly we will all hang separately. It was the Puritan preacher Jonathan Winthrop who called America a city on a hill. Note that he did not call it a shining city on a hill. Ronald Reagan added the word shining for political effect and changed the meaning of Winthrop's metaphor in ways we've not yet recovered from. By adding the word shining, Reagan implied that America was like a lighthouse and that the whole world would look up at us, shining, and see this shining city on a hill, and they would want to come and be part of the greatest country in the world. The light was a symbol of our strength, our manifest destiny, our inherent goodness. But what Winthrop meant was biblical in nature. A city on a hill cannot be hidden from scrutiny, and we must therefore set an example Everyone will be watching us as we seek to build a commonwealth worthy of our freedom because we're a city on a hill. And if we fail to care for one another, to make room for everyone at the table, to practice hospitality to the stranger and spread the wealth of this new land evenly among those who come looking for a better life, if we fail to do that, everyone will see us in our failure. So Winthrop's metaphor was about covenant and mutual responsibility. Reagan's was about power and moral superiority. The Puritan preacher said, be careful to love the neighbor because the whole world is watching. The politician said, take a look at us and you too will want to be like us. One is the language of mutuality, the other is the language of conversion. Now, I bring this up not to belabor a minor occurrence in American political history, but to suggest that triumphalism, whether in religion or in politics, can lead to fascism if there are enough desperate people who can't make ends meet and think the system is hopelessly stacked against them. It is no accident that when Great Britain voted to leave the European Union, their catchphrase was, put the great back in Great Britain. If you hear the same sentiment in Make America Great Again, you get my point. Great means ethically, eth ethnically pure, economically unrestrained, diplomatically belligerent, jingoistic, self-absorbed, xenophobic, and in the case of the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party, good for my business. When George H.W. Bush, the father, watched the Berlin Wall come down. He wisely refrained from scoring any political points from that amazing moment and chose instead to just let the world watch and enjoy that remarkable moment. He did not say, I told you it would come down. Trump, on the other hand, walks around on his golf course in Scotland and when given the news of Brexit, has no sense this is ominous and that a would-be leader of the free world should never politicize it. So as with Orlando, when he congratulated himself on being right about Islamic terrorism, implying that Obama was somehow to blame, Trump claims now to be a prophet of the enraged common man and says others will follow Britain's lead so that we can look forward to what? A retreat to a new European nationalism? A rejection of immigrants that is hauntingly similar to Nazi Germany? and the prospect that it will again be every man or woman for him or herself in a world where only strength and ethnic purity matter because Europe has been there and done that and it was hell on earth. As you know, I spend a lot of time trying to convince people when I'm out talking that preachers, preachers are among the most timid and self-serving of professionals and that the church is mostly a toothless tiger stretched out on the hearth of empire, mostly napping through the most dangerous moments in human history. Because we think we are in the soul-saving business, and besides, we don't want to offend any of our members. Well, guess what? We have arrived at one of those moments, and the church better not nap through it. Maybe we should send 70 of our disciples to Cleveland, 
to protest the clear and present danger that a Trump candidacy represents. Am I the only one who keeps thinking of those words from the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young song? Won't you please come to Chicago or else join the other side? Maybe we need to send 70 of our disciples to the next school board meeting. I mean, <laughs> about the great issue of our time, I would love, love to have Kevin Durant stay in Oklahoma City. <laughs> but I'll be damned if I'm going to act like that's the most important thing happening around here. Maybe 70 of us could put up a billboard that reads, whether Kevin stays or whether Kevin goes, our kids could use some textbooks. Our teachers could use a raise. Our universities must not all be privatized. George Orwell was exactly right when he said that totalitarianism always gives the common man some meaningless diversion games to play, lottery odds to figure, trades to obsess over, as if the fate of nations hangs in the balance. But when our sports teams have become more important than our children, we know the empire has succeeded in amusing us to death. In just a moment, we're going to sing the beautiful song, America the Beautiful. I still believe it is. And if you think I'm not a patriot, you don't know me very well. This fragile, amazing, blood-soaked experiment in democracy is worth saving. But it will only happen if we pay attention to what's happening to us while it is happening to us. Just as Moses came against Pharaoh and Jesus came against Rome, the church must never forget that we were born as a community of resistance so that we can come against all that denies life to our sisters and brothers. And what we must resist is what destroys the future, steals it from our children, enriches the already rich and powerful, and sets neighbor against neighbor by using the most despicable political tool of all, fear of the other. And that's why Great Britain voted to leave, fear of the other. And that's why we might elect Donald Trump the next president, fear of the other. The church has something to say, therefore, in the days ahead, and I'll pray it will be able to say it. The immigrant is not the enemy. Fear is the enemy. Government is not the enemy. Government's as good as bad, or as bad as we decide to make it. Walls are not the answer to anything and have never solved the problem they were built to solve. And pride, well, pride really does go before the fall. Always has, always will. And if I hear one more person compare the Brexit vote to our independence from Great Britain, I'm going to scream. Great Britain was not and is not a colony of the European Union, taxed without representation and servants to a distant master. This is ridiculous. Non sequiturs, we call them in logic. So let us not assume that we can just say anything these days and nobody will call us out. My dear pilgrims, we are still called to build the commonwealth. It is not all about me and it is not all about you. It is about all of us because either all of us matter or none of us do. When you see a young black man sacking your groceries and avoiding your, your gaze, meet it and say, thank you, sir. When you see a woman in hijab walking with her eyes cast down in fear, say, hello, so nice to see you, so glad you are my neighbor. When you see an immigrant family huddled in fear of deportation say, thank you for all that you contribute to our society. When you see a teacher who comes early and stays late and pays for chalk out of her own pocket say, you do the most important work of all. And one of these days we will recognize it. Go out two by two and don't worry about whether some will reject you just be glad some will welcome you to the table and encourage you to spread a message of love, hope, and inclusion. We don't have an unlimited amount of time, but we have each other. And God is not going to save us from ourselves. 
Only we can do that. And I pray that we will. Happy Fourth and Amen. <laughs>